All of our interactions with the world depend on our ability to move. When we eat, we move. When we talk, we move. When we breathe, we move. Even when we sleep and dream, we move. From the moment we're born to our last moment of life, movement is essential for our survival. Some movements seem simple. The first tiny steps of a baby, picking up a cup of coffee, while others require extreme agility, like performing a pirouette, skiing down the slopes, or playing a piano. As most of our movements are made quite effortlessly, it's easy to take our ability to move for granted. But when injury or disease prevents us from moving, it becomes devastatingly clear how fundamental movement is for life. But how do we actually move? We're about to look inside the human body to uncover the fascinating motor system that makes us able to walk, talk, breathe, and live. How we move, as simple as it may seem, actually involves an incredibly complex sequence of actions that are generated and orchestrated by specialized parts of our nervous system, together called the motor system. Movement control really encompasses a number of things. It encompasses the sort of basic structure of the circuits that control movement, and it also encompasses the uh, policies, the control policies that are important for shaping and directing those movements. So what this is telling us is that we have a complex nervous system because we need a complex nervous system to move. More than 600 muscles work together to control the movements of several hundred bones. To move properly, the motor system must precisely control and coordinate the strength and timing of the contraction of each of these muscles. And although the question of how the motor system works has fascinated neuroscientists for the last hundred years. It's amazing how many neurons there are in the cortex. Many details of how this system actually controls movement remain a mystery. It's a fundamental question to try to understand how the many diverse movements that our body does can be generated. If you think about it, you move all the time. I mean, if you watch TV, your eyes move around, you do nothing else, but maybe then you grab for a chip, that's also movement. You decide to get up that you don't like the movie anymore, that's movement. Everything is movement, even breathing, you do the whole day, it's movement. So what do we actually know about how the motor system controls movement? Let's consider what happens when you get hungry. A number of actions need to take place before you can actually eat. First, you probably sense your stomach churning. Then you decide to walk over to the refrigerator. You reach for the handle, open the door, look inside to see what's on the shelves. Then you grab whatever you're in the mood for. Finally, you prepare your meal. These sequentially organized behaviors are meticulously controlled by the motor system which is composed of many regions in the brain and spinal cord that are talking to each other to orchestrate movement control at every moment in time. So how does all this work? Let's go back to the moment you realized you were hungry and decided to go to the refrigerator. Before you even begin to move, a plan needs to be generated. How do I get to the refrigerator? Take the food out and then eat it. This planning process most likely takes place in the cortex the odor layer that lies on top of the largest area of your brain, the cerebrum. Once a plan has been made, the information is broadcast to the entire nervous system, including an area called the brainstem. The brainstem acts like a switchboard, relaying the information for body movements from the brain to the spinal cord. The spinal cord controls the activity of the individual muscles. In this case, the muscle groups needed to walk towards the refrigerator open the door, 
take out the food, and so on. However, movement is more than the actions we plan, like walking to the fridge and grabbing a bite to eat. These movements are deliberate or voluntary. But some movements are not planned at all. They are instead triggered by a sudden, often unexpected event that is detected by our senses. These are called involuntary movements. One classic example would be when we're walking on a very uneven terrain and we want to maintain balance. And so we need to sort of sense where our uh, limbs are, we need to sense the surface, uh, we need to sense whether, you know, say for instance, if we're stepping on a rock, if it's slippery, and we need to use that information to make little corrections to the movement so that we don't lose our balance, fall over, you know, break our stride. But while we know which areas of the nervous system control movement, there's still a lot to discover about how it does it. So while we understand a reasonable amount in terms of how we generate a simple rhythmic movement, um, and, and those are the types of movement that are characterized by swimming, breathing, running, walking. What we don't understand is how that spinal cord and how the networks in the spinal cord are able to generate more complex motor behaviors. So while we've clearly moved the field ahead, there's still a lot that remains to be discovered. The nervous system is made up of billions of cells called neurons. The motor system alone probably contains millions of neurons and likely several hundreds of different types of neurons, if not more. And neurons do not function alone. They're organized into circuits, and each circuit plays a distinct role in controlling movement, much like the different components of an electrical circuit. They must be wired together in a specific way so the circuit works properly. We still know very little about the many different types of neurons, which neurons are responsible for a particular task, and how different types of neurons are wired together to form a circuit. Putting all this together is crucial for our understanding of how the motor system really works. Obviously, the brain is so complex that, and has so many functions that it's difficult to understand its entire complexity. How you go from a thought to actually be able to move, how feeling hunger or thirst is mediated to the movement systems and how we kind of get everything together. Perhaps the best understood type of neuron is the motor neuron. By controlling our muscles, the motor neurons are the crucial final players in the neural control of movement. Whatever type of movement we make, may that be reflexive or a more a planned movement, the end road to movement is always the same. You essentially re recruit a motor neuron in the spinal cord that projects to the muscle, and that fires and then your muscle contracts. And that's at the end of the day how the mechanics of movement works. But coordinated movement requires precise control over timing and sequencing, and how powerfully the motor neuron fires. How does this work? Let's take a closer look at some of the steps that the motor system must control during locomotion. Or put another way, moving from one place to another. Before you begin a movement, you need to decide how fast you want to move, depending on the situation you're in. Should you walk, trot, or run? No matter what gait we use to get from A to B, our legs will need to be precisely controlled and coordinated. So when you move one leg forward, the other leg needs to stay still. This shift between left and right is the basic pattern for walking. When you walk, trot, or run, you obviously use your legs. But at the same time, you'll often find yourself swinging your arms back and forth without really noticing. And while you could, of course, just put your hands in your pockets, using your arms while you're walking actually serves a purpose. It helps maintain your balance, posture, and rhythm. To help maintain your balance and posture when you walk or run, you also need to engage your core muscles. But walking, trotting, or running require more than postural control and coordination between your left and right and arms and legs. The muscles within your limbs need to be coordinated too. 
each limb contains so-called flexor muscles that bend your leg as you walk, and extensor muscles that straighten them. Neural circuits in the spinal cord control these basic patterns of locomotion, such as left-right alternation, coordination between arms and legs, and posture control. But the activity of the spinal circuits are themselves controlled by signals from the brain. For example, signals from the brain stem can tell the spinal circuits when to start and when to stop us moving, and when and how to change direction. Moving to the refrigerator involves more or less the whole body. But once we get to the fridge, we stop, extend our arm, open the fridge door, reach inside, and grab what we want. And these skilled movements of the arms and hands are in fact very different from those used when walking or running. Scientists now know that specific neurons in the brainstem are dedicated to controlling the skilled movements of the arms and hands. Moving your arm is fundamentally different in the context of walking or grabbing an apple. And we identified neurons in the brainstem that regulate a variety of aspects of our arm movements. We, for example, identified a population that is required for the reaching um, towards a target. So, for example, if you want to grab a, a cup of coffee, the first thing you do is extend your arm, and that is called a reaching. The next step is that you grab the cup, and that requires another population of neurons. So we now understand that recruiting the same muscles can have totally different pathways to action, and that these are separate channels in the brainstem. The planning and execution of movements by the motor system is also highly dependent on another important ability, the ability to sense the world around us. As we move, our motor system is constantly being updated by sensory information. This way we can quickly change the way we move when needed. So there are many sensory systems. All of them somehow can influence movements. The entire brain actually hears um, this sens these sensory systems and listens to these sensory systems to plan future actions. We are influenced in terms of how we move by the visual system or by the olfactory systems. If we see that uh, the traffic light is turning to red, we stop. If we smell something good coming from the kitchen, we run to the kitchen. We perceive and interact with the world by watching, listening, feeling, using our senses in general. But one sense is particularly crucial for movement, one that most of us are actually completely unaware of. And it tells the brain what is happening inside of us. We have sensors in all of our muscles that send signals to the spinal cord and then to the brain. These signals tell the brain what our muscles are actually doing. The proprioceptive system is extremely important in relation to movement because it monitors the muscle contractions of each one of your muscles. Our proprioceptive system also tells us where different parts of our body are in space. And while you may not be aware of this sense, try to imagine picking up a cup of coffee without knowing where your arms are. If you close your eye and you stretch out your arm, you will immediately know in which direction your arm is in relationship to your body. And that is what we call precision uh, sense or proprioception. If you lose that, uh, you can still get around with, with having vision and equilibrium. But if you lose that and you close your eyes, you will have very big problems of actually performing many movements. Although there is still a lot to learn, scientists have made significant progress in recent years. Until recently, scientists have been unable to actually identify and manipulate specific types of neurons within the motor system. But this is changing, and the potential implications are huge. I generally am very curious. Yeah, I'm very curious. We'll figure it out, I tell you. Scientists are now able to control the activity of specific types of neurons and see which aspects of behavior they control. They've also discovered that the skilled movements of our arms and hands are controlled by dedicated circuits in the brainstem. And as we've already heard, they've also identified specific cell types in the brain and spinal cord that control different aspects of locomotion, like gait, speed, coordination of our limbs, and core muscles, and also stopping, starting, and turning. 
So they've begun to crack the code of how the motor system actually works. And these discoveries could be vital in our quest to understand what goes wrong when the nervous system becomes diseased or damaged. Think about disease. Some diseases affect one move, type of movement more than another. And if we understand which are the cell types that are regulating that particular type of movement, we can intervene with that without interfering with the other that is still functional in the disease state. So it's a type of precision medicine that at the moment we can only dream about, but which I'm hopeful will come um, relatively soon. So Developing more precisely aimed treatment could hold huge benefits for patients suffering from the many diverse and devastating diseases that affect our ability to move. In Parkinson, we can treat motor symptoms with replacing dopamine or giving L-dopa to patients that will cure some of the motor symptoms, but it won't cure all of them. So from a basic uh, science point of view, the finding the stop cell is a significant finding. These stop cells, when they are activated on one side of the brainstem, are also involved in turning behavior. And we believe that these stop neurons might be involved in that lack of turning ability that you see in late Parkinson's disease. It's difficult to selectively activate those cells in humans, but you can imagine that in future uh, experiments where it would be possible maybe to activate this type of cells more specifically in the brainstem, that it would be possible to use that to alleviate some of the symptoms that you see uh, in, for example, in Parkinson's disease. Developing such treatments in humans is not yet possible. However, experiments in mice suggest that by activating specific cells in the brainstem, some of the devastating symptoms of Parkinson's disease can be reversed. In fact, we have done some experiments with the start cells in a Parkinsonian mouse model, and we can show that by stimulating selectively certain uh, start cells in the brainstem, we can restore the, norm, uh, the locomotor function back to normal. Similar areas in the brainstem can be activated in Parkinson's disease, and this is what we call deep brain stimulation. But in order to be able to stimulate in a clever and precise manner, we need to understand the organization uh, of these circuitries in the healthy and normal brain uh, and selectively brain. stimulate or activate those circuitries as if it was in the normal function. And this has not been possible with the current technology. One thing that has truly advanced our understanding of the motor system is the development of new technologies for studying and controlling it. You said it's a DC motor, it's not a stepping motor? That's right. Yeah. So, um, and so but you just... Has, but it has a rotary encoder. Okay. So yeah, we'll yeah. know exactly where it is. Where, yeah. I was trained as an, as an electrical engineer uh, in India. Uh, and then I was trying to figure out, well, you know, why, why am I trying to build intelligence? Well, you know, humans exist. Right, so let, let me maybe try to build devices that can interface with humans and things like that. And since I've come into the field, uh, what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to build instruments that allow us to measure movement very carefully. So what Tadger is actually doing here is he's designing and, and producing some really sophisticated uh, instrumentation that will allow us to assess the role that sensory feedback plays in controlling movement. How these pathways talk to the neurons that we've been looking at over the last 20 or so years that regulate uh, the activity of uh, muscles and uh, the creation of movement. This is what's really cool now is that I think is this uh, we, we're at a point now where we can take you know engineering expertise you know we can design these really sophisticated you know um, assays for behavior and and now you can ally that to these manipulations of, of different cell types. These new scientific approaches all shed important light on how our nervous system enables our astonishing ability to move and interact with the world around us. 
the ability to move that most of us take for granted can unfortunately be lost in the blink of an eye through injury or disease. And then it's all too easy to understand and appreciate how fundamental movement really is for life. What it would take to fix a broken spinal cord is a lot of basic research where you figure out which are the most important components that need to be in place for the basic movements to work. And when you study basic neuroscience, you realize how complex this is. So you cannot just put together any uh, two type of neurons. You need to put together the hundreds and thousands types of neurons that were properly put together before. But if one can figure out what are the key elements to generate basic movements and one could fix those, that would be a huge step for any spinal cord injured patient. The work that's been done in my lab has been very basic in nature. And drawing a straight line between our discoveries and some future therapy is, is somewhat difficult. But I sort of feel like we're building a, an edifice of knowledge. And I think what is very satisfying to me is to see that I can place a sort of a foundational block in that edifice that others can then build upon. It's going to take time, but neuroscientists and researchers are confident we will eventually solve the remaining mysteries of how we move, one step at a time. The basic research that will be done in the next 10, 20 years will hopefully accelerate this pace of translatability enormously. What before was perhaps a cloud, uh, now you can see individual drops in the cloud. Before you just saw it was raining and the whole garden is wet. And now you know with precision which drop land where. And that gives me hope that some of the work we've done can be applied to patients that would be extremely rewarding for the basic research because it, is, it would be a demonstration of how basic research can have a direct impact on the health of, of patients.